All right, welcome to week two of the semester and the second, this is the preparation for our second meeting. We're going to talk a little bit about electric field, what it is electric field, um, how it's used, and then how conductors are affected in electric fields. All right, and the idea of electric field was proposed by Michael Faraday, who was one of the great experimental physicists back in the 17 to 1800s. Um, but the idea was how to explain this action at a distance. It's, this bothered physicists, and for a long time, people accepted what Newton's idea of gravity is action at a distance. But people have never been comfortable with it. It always kind of seems like magic, and in some ways it, it kind of is. Um, but you can trace out electric field line. These pictures here are of, of positive and negative charges. And then to illustrate the field, they have uh, in an oil subst uh, substance, little tiny pieces of thread that kind of line up with the electric field. They get polarized along with it. And so you can kind of see the effect of an electric field, which we'll see a little bit on um, Monday. And so as being a vector field means it has a magnitude going to be stronger or weaker. And it's also a vector, so it has direction, right? It points from one place to another. And the analogy to that is what's called the gravitational field, uh, lowercase g. You guys usually think of it as the acceleration due to gravity. But a lot of physicists don't like using that because, you know, when we use gravitational fields sometimes, you know, the, a book sitting on a table isn't accelerating due to gravity, but we use g as the acceleration due to gravity to say this is what gravity is doing to the object. Um, the gravitational field is very similar to the electric field. All right. So when you drop something at the surface of the Earth, it accelerates downwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. And that value comes because there is a force acting on it. And that force is the force due to gravity of Newton's gravitational law, the g m1 m2 over r squared, which is very similar to Coulomb's law, k q1 q2 over r squared. So the acceleration due to gravity is very similar you kind of you can measure something about the earth by looking at how objects accelerate from the surface so the value of the earth's gravitational field comes from the constant g the mass of the earth and the radius of the earth so with an electric field we define it kind of the same way basically some charge creates this electric field we're going to use capital q because we're looking at a bigger charge we're looking at something to define what's going on there. So that capital Q doesn't mean it's, it's any different. It's just showing that we're looking at a very specific charge. And then we have a small test charge, Q0, that we're going to bring near it, so it's like a mass on the Earth, and it's going to be accelerated. Now, masses are always, the force is always attractive. Gravity doesn't repel. So as far as we know, there are no negative masses. But charges can be positive or negative. So they can be a positive or negative force. It can be attractive or repulsive, depending on what the two charges are. And so we're going to define that force, F, and the charge, Q, divided by Q0. So the way that works, E, the electric field, capital E, is a vector. It's the force acting on this test charge divided by the charge. Right, so you divide it out, and so it goes away. All right, so the electric field is going to be the same no matter what charge we bring there. We can bring a charge of 1 coulomb, 5 million coulombs, 0.2 coulombs, 5 picocoulombs, something like that. Any charge that we put at this point will measure the same electric field. There will be different forces because the force depends on the charge k, q1, q2 over r squared. r is just the distance from here to here it doesn't really matter what it's what it's going to be this this chest chart cancels out so the electric field depends on the force and the charge so we can use that to define force instead of using f equals ma we can rearrange this to get f is equal to q times e where q is kind of like mass for an electric charge it's just a a property of it and e is the electric field what it experiences from the outside All right e is kind of like the the analogy to it is acceleration and it's a vector a lot of times you draw vectors with an arrow above it just so we can tell it's not just a regular number all right 
Um, one specific type of electric field, the one we're going to deal with the most, is the electric field created by a point charge. So this is a special case of the electric field. E is equal to F over Q is always true. But if we look at a specific field from two charges, the force is the electric constant times Q times Q0 over R squared. So we have these two charges. So E is F over Q0, so the Q0 is cancel. So the electric field from a point charge is very similar to the force from two point charges. It's the 9 times 10 to the 9th multiplied by whatever the charge divided by the distance squared. So the farther you are away from the uh, point charge, the smaller the electric field is going to be. Right, positive charges, kind of stealing this from the book, the electric field moves outward, always outward. Now it doesn't just happen at these uh, twelve different spots here. It's everywhere in between. All right, it's just kind of illustrating it. Positive charge radiates outwards, negative charges it pulls toward. So you kind of think of positive charges as the source of electric field, negative charges as where electric fields end. Right, so it always points from positive charges to negative charges. Another way of thinking of an electric field is the direction the force would be on a positive charge. So if we took a positive test charge and put it near another positive test charge, it would be repelled. So all those electric field lines move away. If we took a positive test charge and put it near the negative charge, it would follow that line back to the negative charge. Right. So if you have more than one charge, the electric field lines can end up going from one to the other. This situation here is called a dipole force, two poles, positive and negative. And then you could also have you know, any collection of charges and create an electric field. One thing, when you're drawing electric field lines, they never cross because it doesn't really make sense because if the lines cross, then you put a charge there, you wouldn't know where it was going to go. You just kind of find the net effect on that charge. So when you're dealing with this, when you have uh, a, an electric field uh, set of problems, the steps that you should really uh, deal with, and this is kind of the same thing you do for any of the problems, so electric field or force, so draw a diagram. Figure out what's going on. Identify all the variables, label them on your diagram, figure out what you know. Identify what point you're trying to find. Are you looking at the electric field at a specific spot? Are you looking at the force on a particular charge? What are you trying to do? Kind of look at what's going on in the problem. Uh, change all the units to regular SI, get rid of centi, milli, micro, pico, nano, all that, th all that kind of stuff. Change it, get, get it into scientific notation. Um, we have a couple equations, basically have three equations. For force we have the equation um, Coulomb's law, K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. Electric field, we have the basic definition, E is equal to F over Q. We also have the electric field of a point charge, K, Q1, K, Q over R squared. All right, then if you have a vector, and you can find, if you have more than one vector, add up all the X components, add up all the Y components, set up the right triangle where all the X components form the, the base of the triangle, the Y components are the, tri the height of the right triangle, and then all you have to do is uh, figure out Pythagorean theorem to find the hypotenuse, which will be the net force or the net electric field, and then trig to find the angle. All right. Inside a conductor, it, it turns out when you put a conductor in an electric field, it's going to distribute the charges along the surface so that the, the field inside is zero. Because if the field inside wasn't zero, what would happen? Sorry. So if the electric field wasn't zero on the inside, there are all these free electrons that could, there are all these electrons that are able to move around. So if there was an electric field that pointed in one direction or the other, they'd move. And as they moved, it would change the electric field, and eventually it would move itself to cancel out completely. Now, it doesn't go to zero instantly. It takes some time because the charges have to move. 
and when you're changing an electric field you can get some different effects as you if you've ever put a piece of aluminum foil or a fork or something like that in a microwave you can see so what happens the electric field is trying to get to zero and all the charges are moving around and then they kind of bunch on any points like the end of the fork or little crumples on the on the uh, aluminum foil and you get sparks because the charges are moving around and they bunch up at points and will spark from there. All right. Um, one thing that you get, and we'll do this a little bit, I believe in lab, because the electric field is zero on the inside and you have all the charge on the, sur the surface, all the extra charge, so in some place it'll be positive, some place it'll be negative, because of that, the field will always be perpendicular to the surface. It always points outward from the surface. And you end up with that thing where you get charge accumulations at sharp points and you get sparks. All right. Um, the last thing I wanted to cover is the idea of the Millikan oil drop experiment. experiment. And a uh, chemist or physicist at UC Berkeley in the... Uh, uh, early 1900s, semi-early 1900s, was trying to figure out the charge of the electron. And what he did is took a uh, spray of oil droplets from an atomizer, atomizer just smells like perfume, uh, fancy perfume uh, dispensers, and fired out little oil droplets. And they were a bunch of different sizes, but they were very small. And he put them through uh, this region where he had applied a certain electric field, a known electric field, and got it so that they would be falling at a constant speed or even standing still. So what was happening is he was watching that and they could figure out the size of the droplets so they could get the mass. They just assuming the oil was uh, uniform density. They could figure out how much mass there was and if it was falling at a constant rate or standing still, you know, the, the weight downwards had to equal the electric force upwards. And so you could rearrange that and get the charge on that drop of oil is the weight divided by the electric field which was known. And when this was done you could see that the only amount of charge was multiples of E, integer multiples of the um, the electric, the elementary charge. So you could have 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs but you couldn't have 1.7, 3.2, 4.8. It was all integer multiples of it. All that 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th. And he very rightly won the Nobel Prize for this work. All right, so when we come to class on Monday, we're going to spend a little time calculating these electric fields. A little more practice with uh, vectors, because a lot of this week's homework just deals with vectors, and we need to know what's going on with them before we move on. Luckily, Wednesday, we're going to get away from vectors, so you don't have to be too upset with it. All right, well, thank you very much, and I'll see you guys on Monday. Uh, feel free to send me any emails. Give it, look ahead if you have a textbook, look through the electric field section. Um, try and give the homework a start, and I'll see you on Monday.